On concert stages around the world, lead singers and guitarists typically get all the glory, prancing about and putting on a show, while keyboardists are usually relegated to a tiny bit of real estate behind a stack of immobile equipment. Some brave souls have attempted to change that. Through their inventions, they've created portable keyboard instruments that can be worn around the neck, like guitars, allowing keyboardists to strut their stuff front and center. Hi, I'm Sam Mims of Centaur, and in this episode of Synth Wizards, we'll take a look at some of those creations and see if we can bring a modern one back to life. Here at Centaur, we live to bring old synthesizers back to life. We find vintage keyboards wherever we can, and our crew restores them back to their original splendor. We also supply parts to tens of thousands of customers all around the world so that they can restore and repair their own keyboards. At our shop in Texas, we have on hand parts for the synths used by pros from the 1960s all the way to today's brand new keyboards. Our inside and out knowledge has made us known as the Synth Wizards. From concert grand pianos to modern electronic synthesizers, keyboard instruments almost always stay in one place on stage, with the player sitting or standing behind them. Our story begins with Carl Relig, a musician who became fed up with this geographical restriction. He invented a new kind of keyboard that could be worn with a strap around the neck. He called his creation the Orphica, and the year was 1795. Orphicas were built in Vienna and were essentially portable pianos with a three to four octave keyboard. While these instruments were not made in large numbers and ceased production in 1820, they did attract the attention of one Herr Beethoven, Ludwig van, who composed two pieces for the novel keyboard. The Orphica sounded more delicate than a piano, a bit like a dulcimer. Rolig advertised that by its nature, it is created for calmness and gentle feelings, for the night, friendship, and love. Even though Relic succeeded in getting keyboardists more mobile, they eventually sat back down behind their instruments and stayed there for most of two centuries. I suppose at this point we should mention the accordion. And so now that's taken care of. The next strap-on keyboard instrument, and the first electric one, hit the market in 1963. During the Cold War era, an East German accordion manufacturer called Weltmeister produced an electromechanical keyboard called the Basset, or Combo Bass, and it made its bass sounds by plucking a tine, similar to a Fender Rhodes electric piano. A single left-hand rocker allowed for volume control. It was battery-powered and was manufactured throughout the 60s, but being made in the Eastern Bloc, it was essentially unknown to the Western world. 1966 saw the introduction of the Tubon, which was manufactured by the Jo Mostad Company, a Swedish builder of electronic organs, and it was distributed in the UK by Livingston Organs. According to Livingston's ads, the Tubon was the big new sound of the 60s, and for an investment of 95 pounds, it could launch your group right through the big band sound barrier. The Tubon was a monophonic, battery-powered, tubular thing weighing in at just five pounds, with a two and a half octave velocity-sensitive keyboard and a speaker at one end. Construction was rather flimsy, it had six preset sounds and was most famously used in concert by Kraftwerk. Paul McCartney was also a Tubon owner, and rumor has it that the intro to Strawberry Fields Forever was originally done on the Tubon, then later replaced by Mellotron flutes when recorded for real at Abbey Road. It was the next decade before portable keyboards really started to appear before the masses. At first, they were one-of-a-kind creations, like this see-through creation of George Dukes. In the early 70s, Edgar Winter added straps to a number of different keyboards, sometimes slinging on a hefty Univox compact piano. Roger Boyd of Head East removed the keybed from his Minimoog and slung it over his shoulder. 
Roger Powell, keyboardist with Todd Rundgren's Utopia, built an over-the-shoulder controller called the Probe. Wayne Famous of the producers customized a full-size Oberheim keyboard as a strap-on controller with the synthesizer guts mounted remotely in a rack, and he suffered back trouble as a result of the 37-pound load. He later switched to using a 15-pound Oberheim XK MIDI controller. A company called Hillwood released the Rocky Board RB1 in 1977, attempting to mass-produce strap-on keyboards, but they never amassed many customers. Apparently influenced by Edgar Winter, the Rocky Board was a 61-note electronic piano with a pedal unit for control of volume, sustain, and a low-pass resonant filter. Another strap-on keyboard that began appearing on stages was the Davis Clavitar, a 37-key controller with a futuristic-looking neck. It created no sound on its own, it just sent controller data to whatever synthesizer it was hooked up to. It was frequently seen on stage with George Duke and Herbie Hancock. As the 1970s began drawing to a close, the story began to take another turn. Rather than suffering through strapping on a big, heavy, bulky instrument that was designed to be stationary, or simply strapping on the key bed of a remote synthesizer, it began to look commercially viable to produce a synthesizer that could be worn around the neck like a guitar. And to learn the next chapter of this story firsthand, Mary and I jumped into the synthmobile and drove for days far away from Texas, across snow-covered mountains, all the way to Moscow. No, not that Moscow. We drove to Moscow, Idaho, where I met with a true synth wizard, George Matson. George Matson was the inventor of the Centaur, the first commercially available synthesizer designed to be worn over the shoulder. And this wasn't a cheesy sounding electric piano, it was a full-blown two-oscillator monosynth that sounded great. And the neck of the Centaur wasn't just for hanging on to it. The left-hand controllers on the neck gave immediate control of a tremendous range of functions, making it a very expressive instrument. He was trying to get people from out behind stationary keyboards to get out there with the guitar players. And I designed a left-hand controller for it. That was basically the main reason I did it. And I had nine, well, originally 16, but found out that was kind of overkill, but basically nine continuously variable CV controllers in the neck that were applied to uh, specific functions. So you could, you could do multiple CVs based on how coordinated you were with your fingers. A lot of people thought that they were just like on a push buttons and they're not, they're continuous controllers and they're spring loaded so they return back to zero when you let out the pressure. So there's a lot of control in them. When I approached DML to design the electronics and tell them about the concept, it's time Dale Blake, who's the president, and, and told him about this thing and said, I got a name for it too. I want to call it the Centaur because it makes sense. <laughs> and he says, you can't. I said, why not? He says, it's copyrighted. I said, well, who copyrights that we did? <laughs> and they had that and get sin and trademarked or copyrighted and stuff. And so, but when I hired them to, uh, hired, hired them to design the electronics for me, uh, talked him into selling me the name Centaur for a buck. Do I owe you a dollar for using the name? No, it's not spelled the same. <laughs> All right. And when we get the Centaur out, I'll strap it on you and we can say that we put the U in Centaur. So you have continuous control over all of these different modulation features. Oh, yes. What does FU stand for? <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm demonstrating the FU button. What does it stand for? 
Filter up. Filter up. <laughs> okay. You're all filtered up. So, yeah, see what you mean. You can just hold the key and yeah. play over here all day long. No, you just hit the sustain key on that. Don't even need to hold it. What you mean? Oh, this way you need Yeah. You know, let's decide so you can actually set it on top like a Rhodes or something like that. You reach over and still play that stuff. While the Centaur earned a place in the history books, less than 10 were ever manufactured. Matson wasn't trying to be a synthesizer manufacturer. His goal was to sell the concept and the design to an established company, but things didn't go according to plan. I came up with the idea here in town and, and uh, went to work uh, building a prototype out of, out of uh, EML circuit modules. And it was made of wood, had a steel panel, weighed about 25, 30 pounds, and I lugged it to the 1979 NAM show in Atlanta and wandered around trying to show it off to uh, manufacturers, trying to get them to manufacture it. And, and I showed it to a lot of people, and somebody was interested. Bob Moog had stopped by to check out the Centaur, but he was no longer in the music business at the time. But someone from the company Moog had founded also stopped by and expressed an interest in producing the Centaur. And Matson was excited to think his creation could reach a wide audience. Six months later at the Winter Nam show, I saw the prototype of the Moog Liberation and figured that they weren't going to contact me, so I made my own. Right there in Moog's booth, strapped onto a mannequin, was a Moog Liberation portable synthesizer. It was clear that Moog wasn't going to be selling Centaurs. To beat them to market, Matson immediately took out an advertisement in Downbeat magazine, offering Centaurs for sale under the company name of Performance Music Systems. Suddenly, he was a manufacturer. I knew nothing about manufacturing as a geology student. I mean, it's... Despite having no manufacturing experience, Matson's Centaur is a very well-built piece of equipment, and other than a slightly scratchy potentiometer, it had no problems coming to life when I visited, some 40 years after it was put together. The last few Centaurs were assembled and sold as recently as 2007, one of them going to Jean-Michel Jarre. With the unique experience of playing the Centaur in the presence of its creator, we headed back to Texas with plans to bring back to life a different strap-on synthesizer that has been needing some TLC. When the Moog Liberation hit the market, it did so with the manufacturing and marketing skills of an established music business behind it. While the Centaur was an important historical milestone, Moog sold a couple of thousand Liberations throughout the early 80s, and suddenly you could spot these mobile keyboards on album covers, on MTV, and on concert stages. The basic philosophy, besides the idea of developing an instrument that could put a player in front of the band and show electronic music and the electronic sound as perhaps the most important sound that could be heard in that band. The original philosophy was to expand the whole world of Moog and take over where some other companies were not successful. Keyboard players always wanted to be out front with the guitar players because that's how you get the girls. Um, and uh, at the time, 
Moog was part of the musical conglomerate uh, Norlin, and Norlin owned Gibson guitars. So we spent a lot of time uh, with the Gibson people over in Kalamazoo and in Nashville talking about characteristics of guitars and how it should hang, where the weight distribution should be, all this good stuff. Uh, Liberation was based on a synthesizer that we built for Radio Shack called the MG1. And the guts of Liberation are essentially that synthesizer. Like the MG1, the Liberation was a two oscillator monosynth, which also contained a polyphonic section. And without the MG1, the Liberation might not have happened. You build an instrument for Radio Shack and they're going to order in quantity, which really helped in the development of Liberation because we were able to cut costs in so many areas because the MG1 paid for it. The neck of the Liberation sported a ribbon controller, identical to that on the Micro Moog. The ribbon controller could change the pitch of a note simply by sliding your finger up or down it, which allowed players the ability to do guitar-like hammer-ons and bends. The keyboard itself also responded to aftertouch, which was pretty uncommon for a synthesizer in that day. People responded to Liberation like no other instrument because it was, you could treat it like like you treated a guitar. When you played the instrument, you hugged it. You put your arms around it. So people just had, they, they fell in love with the thing. In 1982, Roland released a small single oscillator monosynth that could be strapped over the shoulder with the addition of an optional mod grip. The SH-101 was delivered mostly in gray, but blue and red versions were also available. And decades later, these little jewels have become enormously popular for techno and acid music. The mod grip of the SH-101 contained a pitch bender that could be worked with the middle finger and a button on the end that could trigger vibrato with a press of the thumb. In the years that followed, many manufacturers jumped into the strap-on keytar market. Yamaha made several mini keyboards that could be worn with a strap, like the CS-01 analog synth, the digital DX100, and the SHS-10 MIDI controller. Korg's Poly 800 synth included strap pegs when it debuted in 1983, and their RK100 MIDI controller hit the streets in 84. 30 years later, it was re-released as the RK100S, which included a mini Korg sound engine. And most recently, the Alesis Vortex MIDI controller and a completely wireless version, the Vortex Wireless 2, have been released, which feature left-hand controls quite similar to those on the Moog Liberation. Roland had hit a home run with the SH-101, and they followed up with a number of strap-on MIDI controllers, like the AX-1 and AX-7, as well as full synthesizers like the AX Synth and the new AX Edge. We came across a broken AX Synth on our travels, and all this talk of keytars got me interested in getting it fixed up and having some fun with it. On this black beauty, every eighth key across the keyboard won't play. Additionally, it must have been dropped on its end at some point, because the casing where the strap connects is smashed up. So we'll not only need to do some electronics repair, but some body work as well. Time to hand this one off to Gerald and see if he can work some magic. So Gerald took a piece of the backyard here at Centaur and decided he was going to plant some watermelons. So let's take a look at his little garden. So these are the watermelon plants he put in a couple of days ago. And I keep asking him, are the watermelons yet? Just teasing him. And so I got a little surprise for him this morning. So Mary bought a watermelon the other day and I thought, I think I'll bring that to work for a minute. That'll work. Now we'll see how Jerome likes it. He got a watermelon. Look at it. Look at that. Cause watermelon going on. Oh, is it? Since I obviously don't know a watermelon plant from a cucumber plant, Gerald cranked me right back. 
Hey, 62s are coming in just nice this year. The AX synth can be powered by eight AA batteries, which is great for portability, but not so great when those batteries are left in for months or years while the keyboard sits unused. When Gerald opened this one up, he found that the batteries had leaked, dripping battery juice into the guts. This juice is really potassium hydroxide, which is dangerously corrosive, and it can make a terrible mess of your electronic toys. Gerald found that the contact board underneath the keys had five points where traces had been corroded, and that's what was causing every eighth key not to play. The fix is to clean away the corrosion, find the broken trace points, and solder in a thin strand of wire to bridge the gap. The other issue with this AX synth is the smashed end. Removing the strap pin on the end showed a severely bent screw, meaning that this keyboard took a pretty good drop at some point. Someone has glued it back together, but it still looks pretty bad, and with the weight of the keyboard on that strap pin, we don't want to trust that it won't break again and take another fall. Fixing this will take some special skills, but Gerald used to run an automotive body shop, and I'm confident that he'll come up with not only a fix to make it strong again, but to make it look great as well. We often marvel at how friendly and how cool our customers are. Even when we goof up on an order, you synth peeps are very patient and forgiving, and the bar for friendly and cool just seems to keep getting set higher. I'm uh, Jeremy Mix from Encore Instrument Repair out of Dayton, Ohio. Um, we're a full-service instrument repair shop, and uh, Centaur has been a big help to us, whether they knew it or not, uh, in providing parts for our, for our shop when we can't get them from manufacturers. I drove down here with uh, a trailer full of old keyboard parts that, uh, that we had and uh, we decided to be in better hands with, with Sam and we can just buy them back from him uh, when we need them instead of uh, having to sort them through ourselves. So that's why I'm here and uh, just thrilled to meet the team. That's right, Jeremy said, not only do I want to give you this trailer full of old keyboards for parts, but I'd like to deliver them to you from Ohio. Well, what could we say? Jeremy Mix, come on down. That trailer was as full as it could possibly be, and we'll be working a while to get all those keyboard carcasses taken apart and cataloged. These parts donors are gonna keep a lot of other keyboards alive. After unloading, we feasted on donuts and coffee, and I saw the opportunity for a good challenge. I can't help but notice that we're kind of the same physique. Are right? you? And so I'm thinking that maybe we should arm wrestle when we're down there. You're going to put me to shame, Sam. I can tell you. <laughs> People are going to want to know which of those big buff guys <laughs> should take down the other. <laughs> On three. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Oh, come on, try. <laughs> Pick me up off the ground. <laughs> All right, I almost had you done. Yeah, you did. So the arm wrestling didn't go exactly as planned. Uh, we were actually pretty much head to head until Eddie hollered go, and then he was able to sneak around me and come out with the win. I think if you go back and look at the tape, it'll be pretty clear that, that he had an obvious advantage from the glare from the windows and such. I think his side of the table was a little higher, so he had the height advantage. And um, despite all of that, I uh, came out with a pretty solid second place finish, I'd say. Yeah, my, my, my feet were off. His feet were off. <laughs> To glue back the broken plastic screw mounts in the AX synth, Gerald used an epoxy, and since this is all on the inside where it won't be seen, he globbed it on pretty liberally to strengthen the repairs. After that, he added a metal bracket on the inside to take the force of the strap pin screw. For the smashed end of the casing, he went after it as if he were repairing a car body. Starting to feel like I'm one of the Kardashians or something around here. 
With the pieces glued into place, he applied Bondo glass, which is a fiberglass body compound that can be filed to shape and then sanded to a smooth finish. The fiberglass is very strong, so we can count on this not breaking again. Then it gets sanded into shape and it's ready for paint. It'll be nearly impossible to match the black sparkle finish that Roland used, so in order to paint over the repair, Gerald proposed a couple of uh, creative ideas. I got another idea. See, if, if we paint these right here, these keys, the rest of them, rest of them black down here and just leave them white, that look like a crescent wrench, a big, big stelson wrench. I was like, see, look, we just paint it right there. We'll put the keys and paint them right there, and that'd be a big ass crescent wrench. That's what it is. See? And then you can use <laughs> this for the handle, tighten them bolts up with it and shit. It worked just fine. Creativity run rampant. After Gerald completed the bodywork, the smashed end of this keyboard looks great. You can't tell that it had ever been broken. Now the challenge will be to either customize the paint scheme over the repair, and I gotta tell you, I'm not that into the pipe wrench idea, or to match the black metal flake paint. And the close proximity of the AX Synth logo makes either of these options challenging. So while I'm worried about whether we'll be able to pull this off or not, Gerald walked into my office with the AX Synth front panel, all painted and looking perfect, except for a tiny spot where a bug decided to land. It's a black paint with blue metal flake, oversprayed with a clear coat. I don't know how he matched it so perfectly, but other than the bug, it sure looks great. I told Gerald to put it back together because I couldn't wait to play it. We can tidy up that bug spot later. I started doing some research on keytars and strap-on synthesizers and became so fascinated with these cool and crazy things that we pulled out a Roland AX synth that was on life support. In short order, Gerald had reversed the damage from leaking batteries and gotten all the keys working again. Then he shifted to bodywork and repaired the smashed up end and somehow painted it to match the beautiful black metal flake. Now, it's time to have some fun with it. That's how you get the girls.
Sam, in honor of your visit, I hereby bequeath you an extra, extra small centaur <laughs> t-shirt with the original vintage design from its inception. That's fabulous. You, you spelled centaur wrong, though. <laughs> you left the U out. <laughs> George, in honor of our <laughs> visit, I hereby bequeath you What's it look the, like? The centaur shirt. It's, it's spelled it, wrong. It's got you a got a U in there. <laughs>